Terry Jastrow began his career in the entertainment industry with ABC Sports. During his time with ABC, he produced or directed many major sporting events, including a Super Bowl, six Olympic Games, and 60 major golf championships. It just, just a couple of years ago in 2015, he directed and produced and wrote a feature film entitled The Squeeze, and in 2016 he wrote the stage play The Trial of Jane Fonda, which was produced in London and received a nomination for Best New Play Off West, and he is of course an Emmy Award winner, and now he is an acclaimed novelist for The Trial <laughs> of Prisoner 043. In conversation with Terry Jastrow tonight is his wife, Ann Archer. Uh, herself, an Academy Award-nominated actress, uh, best known for her role in Fatal Attraction. She is also, uh, just learned, the founder of the organization Artists for Human Rights, uh, an organization doing some great work out there. To introduce Terry, please join me in welcoming Ann Archer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam. with us. <laughs> Actually, I'm uh, I'm starting because I have to brag about my husband. Thank you all for being here, and uh, this is great. And um, his book, you know, he spent three and a half years writing this book, researching it, and writing it, and it was really a labor of love. He went through a lot, and uh, we were just overwhelmed with the fabulous reviews that it's been getting. It just came out. It was the first day of publication was August 1st, which was Tuesday. So anyway, I have to brag a little bit before he starts talking and read uh, two excerpts from two reviews because I think they're so lovely. So this is me being the wife. <laughs> uh, Terry Jastrow's debut novel, simultaneously fictional and historically compelling, pulsates a throbbing plot and quintessential questions of the criminality of the Iraq War. With precision and passion, rare intelligence, and a journalistic integrity, the trial of prisoners 043 delivers Bush to the Hague's ICC, International Criminal Court, to be tried for war crimes. And another, by now it should be clear that the trial of prisoner 043 is no ordinary political thriller. The kinds of questions it raises, its careful ability to toe the line between real facts and higher level thinking and questions, and its mix of intrigue with court proceedings place it on the level of John Grisham, but with a deeper intention to political detail and broader ethical and moral considerations that make it especially intriguing for politically minded readers. Anyway, that's just a few, and they've all been really glaring. Yeah. Okay, Thank so you. Terry Jastro. Thank you. <laughs> see, see what happens when you pay off reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's very flattering. I, I, I read those and I just get goosebumps. It's, um, it's uh, you know, you work so hard on a book, and it's really gratifying when people appreciate it. Uh, we're very happy to be in Seattle. Actually, uh, 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 Anne's father uh, lived in Seattle the last number of years of his life. And uh, for those of you who know a little something about golf, I, I've always loved Fred Couples, Freddie Couples. He comes from Seattle. He's such a beautiful man. And uh, we were driving out here today uh, and in a taxi, and uh, we, we were chatting with this guy. He's from Ethiopia and really lovely guy. And he said, well, what are you coming all the way out here for? And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a writer, and I've uh, just published my first novel. What's it about? And I told him about it, and he said, oh, my God, I have to read that book. And I said, well, that's kind of you. So he said, by now we're putting up. He said, you don't understand. I have to read it. I, he said, I'm, can I guess? I said, well, uh, how about this? I'll go in and buy you that book and give you the book as a tip. <laughs> so, 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 uh, Zach and Sam uh, are happy. We've already sold one book for. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's uh, the title as was mentioned. It's the trial of prisoner. 043. You guys are, I'm sure, already ahead of us because George W. Bush was the 43rd President of the United States. And uh, it's a story, it's a novel that uh, imagines that he uh, was uh, abducted off a golf course uh, in St. Andrews, Scotland, and transported against his will to the International Criminal Court in The Hague to stand trial for war crimes of which he's accused. Um, Many people want to know why I would write that story, and I'll just cut to the chase right away. I, I, I wrote that story because I love my country, 
but I think we fight too many unnecessary wars. I think we fight wars that could be avoided. And uh, when we think about the, the damage, the cost of life in our treasury, um, it, it, they just cannot be waged uh, uh, with impunity and have uh, the citizens forget about it or we're destined to more such wars. And um, I just feel that there's, when, when you think about it and extrapolate it out, there's only one thing that can end the madness, which is an informed and engaged citizenry, the people. Many of us were around uh, at, at, during the Vietnam War, and we will remember that it was the protest of the people, mostly kids, maybe some people in this room, who said, this has got to stop, this is madness, it's, it's crazy, and ultimately uh, we're effective in ending the war. So, um, yeah, and I, 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 I love my country. I'm, I'm the guy who's, uh, you know, standing uh, too erect and singing the Star Spangled Brander way out of tune and with a tear in my eye. Uh, so uh, I, I felt uh, someone had to write it, and then I said, well, you know, if not now, then when, and if not me, then who? Um, and so um, I, am a, I am a screenwriter and a playwright, but the story... Uh, what once I had sort of uh, mocked it up, what it would be in general terms, I felt was so uh, huge uh, and dense that it could not be done easily, could not be accommodated easily in either a screenplay or a stage play. So that left me on the doorstep of writing the novel, uh, which is uh, basically the hardest thing I've ever done with all the Olympics and all the Super Bowls. I say it's a, uh, a, um, a literary ascent up Everest. Trying to get, but um, uh, I, I want to say here at the, at, at, at the outset that um, uh, I hold no grudge against George W. Bush. This is, this is not um, a, a personal vendetta against him at all. In fact, I know him. Um, um, he, um, I met him more than 50 years ago uh, when his daddy was uh, an oil man in, in Midland, Texas. So was my dad. That's what you hear in both of our voices. In fact, I played Little League Baseball against him. He was on the Cubs. Uh, I was on the Braves. And I'm too uh, modest to say who won the game, but the Cubs lost. <laughs> when he was a young uh, oil man in Houston, I was at the University of Houston, and uh, we saw each other socially a few times, which is saying something because those are in the days before he stopped drinking. So he, he was a pretty good party guy, as he would be the first to admit. And when he was uh, governor of the state of Texas, uh, he invited Ann and I in for a little meeting, and we were in there for two hours with him with his boots on the desk talking about this, that, and the other. Um, and uh, he's a, a really a charming and gre gre gregarious guy. He's the life of any party. Uh, you, you know, he'd win any popularity contest. But uh, governance is not a, a popularity contest. Governance is about war and peace and the sanctity of human life. And so I, 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 uh, I launched out to, uh, to write this story. Um, uh, one of my favorite things about writing, though, is uh, research. Uh, I'll just tell you off the crack of the bat, I do not consider writing labor. I consider it art, and I actually love it. Um, uh, and so I, I, I feel that um, uh, re research is, is like a treasure hunt. I mean, you, you, you know, there's ba basically there's, uh, there's three different uh, categories of content that all writers and everybody has access to, which is the first is their, their knowledge base, what, what, what do they know already. Second would be um, interviewing people who are authorities or know something about it. And the third, generally speaking, is just research. I mean, all the books and articles, and, and now we have the internet, and more and more the internet is accurate, because we all know it wasn't necessarily in the beginning. And, and it has, it has the, the capacity of not just being from one point of view. You know, if you surf enough, you can get lots of points of view. So I love, I love research. And, and once I had a kind of an idea of what the story was, was going to be and had found a lot of information about it, I became a student of international criminal law. Uh, because uh, it just sort of is, is, is there to be seen that uh, it's unlikely that America would bring a former president to the United States uh, for trial against whatever. It, it just, it's just unlikely. It's never happened, and it may never happen. Just no, no more than, than you know, a German trial could bring the Nazi criminals to trial. It's just, it's just not in the cards. But uh, 
Uh, following World War II, uh, the United Nations, uh, which basically oversaw the Nuremberg trials, which uh, Nuremberg, as you probably know, is a little small town in Germany, uh, and 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 there were uh, 11 uh, Nazi um, commanders. Um, Hitler and Goering, cowards that they were, uh, committed suicide before the trial. But the Nuremberg trials uh, were conducted, and uh, you know, probably fairly and certainly not surprisingly, uh, they were found uh, guilty and put to their death. Following um, uh, the Nuremberg trials, uh, the United Nations hosted in, in Rome, Italy, uh, a, a, a few month long um, uh, uh, gathering uh, to focus on international criminal law. And 159 nations showed up. I love it that it was 159 and not 160. If it were just 160, it would have been a li little easier to memorize. But so 160, 159 nations showed up, in, very much including the United States. And that for months, they discussed, debated, probably argued, and ended up drafting something called the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And it is the 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 the, the document is the governing document of international criminal law. Uh, and the United States, by the way, not only participated in that process, but was a signatory to it. So, uh, and, it, and it became, after finally uh, the, the nations uh, debated it and, 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 and signed it. it, it came a force in July of 2002. George W. Bush's war was raged in March of 2003, and thus he becomes the first leader of a superpower subject to international criminal court, international criminal law. Um, so we, we, we put our attention uh, then on uh, the Iraq war, but in order to understand the Iraq war, th these are all things that you, you would know and we'll just recall them together because when pieced together, uh, you know, in a new unit of time, uh, you know, it may, it may reveal some things uh, to us. But uh, it, it, the story of the Iraq war actually starts with 9-11. So September 11 was 2001, and uh, we, we all remember in our hearts and minds what that was all about. There was a huge uh, outpouring of sympathy and love for the United States after 9-11. And George W. Bush uh, uh, was uh, uh, had a popularity rating, approval rating of 90%, among the highest of all presidents ever, 90% approval rating. He had every legal justification in the world to track down and bring Osama bin Laden to justice. So that was September uh, uh, of, 19, uh, of 2001. By September of 2002, with, with the whole force and intelligence of the U.S. military and people knowing that he was in, was in Afghanistan, the hills of Afghanistan, we, we had him pinned a time or two in Tora Bora. There's really interesting stories and novels about how we had him in our sights. But nonetheless, after more than a year, we had not brought Osama bin Laden to justice. And George W. Bush began to enter into the discussion other elements, this axis of evil, which would include Iraq, and uh, uh, suggesting that Saddam Hussein had linkage to 9-11. Now, there were 19 terrorists for 9-11. Fifteen of them were from Saudi Arabia. Two of them were, was from the um, uh, United uh, uh, Arab Emirates, one from Egypt, one from Lebanon, none from Iraq. Saddam had nothing to do uh, with 9-11, with, with and if anything, Saddam Hussein was the enemy of Osama bin Laden. When it was proven that it was impossible to create linkage between Saddam and 9-11, Bush began to change the dialogue to the, 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 the presence of weapons of mass destruction. We all remember that, WMD. Now, uh, uh, the question becomes what he knew and when he knew it. Uh, but he, uh, he was continuing to beat the drum that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, so much so that this allegation with no proof is what he went to uh, Congress with to get war powers. Only Congress can grant a president war powers. Uh, and, and so even though uh, the United Nations and the USA had spent had sent hundreds of weapons inspectors, and they 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 visited and searched unopposed and uninterrupted hundreds of sites, former sites, interviewing people around there and saying there's no evidence of weapons of mass destruction. 
Bush, because he's a he's a uh, 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 he's a very con convincing guy and he's a personable guy. He gets Congress to grant him senators and, and House of Representatives people that we elect. So let's just let's just keep the fact that we have skin in this game as we go along, because at the end of the day we've got to make something in all of this. And so Congress uh, get, grants him war powers, and he sends Colin Powell no less to the United Nations, who has said repeatedly that that he doesn't think they're weapons of mass destruction. But Bush convinces Colin Powell to go to the United Nations and say in front of the United Nations Assembly that that the, that uh, uh, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction, and the UN goes along with it. And he gets his war power, powers, and so the war is going to begin. It's going to, be, it's going to start in March of 2003. The world protests on a scale that had, it had never done before or after. A million people marched in London. A million people marched before that war in Paris. It's, you know, six, seven, eight million people around the world. Pro it's the largest single human protest in history was the, before the Iraq war. But sure enough, and, and, and by the way, and to, also to the point, heads of state were pleading with George W. Bush to not rush into the war. Just wait for the, for the exploration of weapons of mass destruction to yield the truth, the facts about it. Pleading with him, even the Pope was pleading with him to just wait on, but he didn't wait. He couldn't wait. He started this war. Shock and awe they called it. And in they went, the coalition forces, and the war started. The war lasted uh, eight years and nine months. Now, uh, in any war, there's, 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 there's casualties and collateral damage. So let's just focus on this one. That war killed 4,491 American soldiers. I say 4,491 because every single one of those lives matter. It matters to their family and it matters to us. It mattered then and it matters now. And it will never stop mattering. And we can't let it stop mattering. We, that war wounded 230,000 Americans physically and or mentally. Many of the, our wounded warriors to this day were using our treasury to help, help these warriors. And if that's not bad enough, that war killed a million Iraqis, more than a million Iraqis that war killed. And so the cost of human lives is, is horrible when we think that, that if you love humanity and the sanctity of human life, the, the, the one life murdered at, for a false cause is, is uh, uh, you know, against our basic values, much less all the people that died. Somewhat uh, parenthetically, because nothing's more important than human life, I think we would all agree, but let's take a moment to think about and focus on the U.S. Treasury that George Bush's administration spent during that war and is continuing to spend. Now, for those who may deal in orders of magnitude uh, higher than me, a trillion is 12 zeros. A trillion, a trillion is a, a hundred billion, and we have spent more than four trillion dollars and continue to spend on that war and the, 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 the helping of, of our troops that were wounded in that. Just think about what could happen with that treasury to help the American people. Education, more schools, better schools, better education, better teachers, uh, fighting poverty, the dual problem of hunger and obesity, uh, crumbling inner structures. You have, you have your own thoughts about it, a, 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 a debt that's so high it chokes us. This is our treasury. And by the way, people, we provide the treasury by paying our taxes. This is not their money to squander away on wars that, that, that could be avoided. And so we have not only a crime of, 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 of taking people's life, but we have a crime of robbery in terms of taking our treasury. So uh, in my story, uh, George W. Bush is put on trial at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Uh, among the things that I re researched uh, uh, far and wide in the three and a half years of research was uh, international criminal law and what it was all about. And I hired inter international criminal law experts in the United States and the UK to kind of tutor me. I took uh, online a course in international criminal law that you had to pass to finish. I flunked it twice. 
<laughs> finally passed it in the third take. Uh, I also took an online course on, on, on novel writing by James Patterson. I was on a roll. Um, and and, and there were, I, I found, uh, because if, if, you know, if you look, you can find beautiful things. But that was greatly advantaged because many of the protagonists, many of the characters in this story have written books, first-person books about it. So you get their voice and their point of view. George W. Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, uh, Colin Powell, uh, uh, importantly Richard A. Clark, who was Bush's uh, chief uh, 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 terrorism authority in, in, the, in this administration. There were great books written on, on the Iraq War, one by Bob Woodward that we all know well, one by Michael Isakoff and David Korn. There's a ton of, of resource material, and you get these guys quoted. They're actually, some of it is from addresses to Congress and the United Nations and uh, national addresses from the White House and on the records comments. So when you read uh, th this book, which I hope you do, uh, you, th this, th it, it is, I had, uh, you international criminal experts on both sides of the Atlantic vet it for authenticity and accuracy and both of them separately after the read of the final draft said that it was word perfect with regard to the, the, the truth and accuracy. So we put him on trial, he gets put on trial for uh, something called war crimes um, and, 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 and the thing that's important about international criminal law is that a bedrock principle is that it first focuses on the, the single person most responsible for the, crim, the, for the commission of the crime. So a lot of people ask, well, what about Cheney? What about Rumsfeld? In international criminal law, they start with the single person most responsible. George W. Bush was president, and he was commander-in-chief. Without him, that war would have never happened or could have happened. So he's the one most responsible for it. And when you learn what he did and when he did it and what he do, knew, you can draw your own uh, 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 conclusions about it. But surely if he were to be found guilty in the International Criminal Court, uh, uh, others would be subject to trial as well. The other thing uh, uh, to, to, to note when I, sh I wanted to go uh, r write this story is it's a fundamental rule of drama. Uh, that the thing that propels drama is conflict. And what is conflict? Conflict is two or more opposing forces in opposition with each other. And the greater the forces, the more power the forces, the more, greater the collision. The bigger the conflict and the more the drama. So I spend a lot of time uh, at the International Criminal Court with prosecution attorneys and defense attorneys. Swat slapping this thing around. I wanted to get a sense of their passion, their vocabulary, their behavior, uh, 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 and 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 actually uh, study when the prosecuting attorneys and the defense attorneys were very effective in the international criminal courtroom. And so you'll see that there. I will just tell you uh, uh, that 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 there in the prosecution prosecuting attorney there is an attorney from the United States, and there is an, an attorney there from Iraq. That's on the on the prosecution team, George W. Bush's defense team are a couple of high-powered po gunslingers that come in to represent him, and so the case begins. Um, and I will tell you that in the earlier drafts, I was very careful to get the legal aspects right, but uh, I knew all along that this was not a textbook. This was a novel. It wasn't so much for information as it was entertainment. So I promise you it's not too legalese. It's very dramatic. dramatic. There's not a lot of legal, legal words, and if there are, they're explained somewhere in, in the text. Um, and one of the great things about it in the story is that, uh, you know, I come from a background of sports. So when you go to the Super Bowls and Olympics, there are these huge uh, screens, huge screens. Well, not only are they installed for the first time at the International Criminal Court, like Wimbledon or like the Super Bowl uh, uh, or a rock concert, they are established by, by international courts in, in headquarters in capital cities around the world. There's such interest and such passion in this story that people can't wait for the news. They want to see it live. So they're broadcasting live from the International Credit Card to these huge uh, thing with, uh, with live audio and video. It's really interesting how we, you know, we made an attempt to make it, you know, the first 
uh, a, a case that was followed by the world, but it would be the first leader of a, of, a, of, a, of a country that was put on trial at the International Criminal Court. So, uh, uh, the, the, uh, of, of, there's about to 12 or 13 different uh, crimes uh, identified in uh, 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 war crimes. Uh, you, you, you would guess uh, most of them, but th there's murder, and there's uh, um, uh, prisoner abuse and torture. There is uh, extensive uh, destruction of civilian property not justified by military necessity and others. It's sort of, if you wage a full-on war uh, for eight and a half years, uh, with the, you know, starting with shock and awe and hundreds of thousands of U.S. forces and coalition forces, you're going to kill a lot of people and destroy a lot of things. It's axiomatic. It's no accident. It happens. And thus, it happens intentionally. And so the question is, is it legal? And if it's not legal, what will happen? How, is he, how could he be found guilty and what would happen to him? And I will promise you this. I'm going to stop talking here for in, in just a little bit. You may think you know what happens, but I spent countless hours over countless weeks and months and maybe years trying to craft a narrative that people will, I don't think, would ever guess or imagine what happened. So don't go to the end of the book and start reading. You do yourself a favor. All right, uh, so let me just see if I've missed anything. Yes, I have missed uh, one or two things. Um, I, uh, one of the byproducts of this, uh, this, uh, this book is uh, I, I, I think it's very, very important that we're all aware of the International Criminal Court, which you now know is a beautiful uh, 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 a courthouse uh, that's in The Hague, which is a divi area of, uh, the, of the, the, the Netherlands. You, you fly to Amsterdam, which has a uh, you know, Van Gogh Museum and a Rembrandt Museum and great restaurants. I mean, it's a very good place to go and visit. The International Criminal Court and, and International uh, Criminal Law, uh, which is governed by the Rome Statute, which you may know of, but, but we've talked about here. It is every bit as much as we sit here today, citizens of America, it is every bit as important as U.S. law in the, 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 the security and protection of humanity, including Americans. So I hope everybody pays attention to that. I would also tell you that just last week, something really happened that was, was broken in the press, that there was an Iraqi general who served in that war who in the UK brought Tony Blair to court in the UK and just la last week, for charges, for, uh, for, uh, charges of war crime, for, mm -hmm. for in connection with the Iraq War, and and the ruling from the UK court said, now listen carefully, it said that that the concept of war crimes does not exist in British law. Doesn't say he's innocent. Does it just says, which which we come to international criminal law. It, 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 British law, British courts do not, cannot deal with war crimes as defined and on this basis, which leaves the door open for this Iraqi general to now transfer the case because, it, it, because the International Criminal Court stands above all national courts, remember, when they are unable or unwilling to prosecute. So, so this Iraqi general presumably would know and now move the Tony Blair trial to the International Criminal Court, which is exactly what happens in my story <laughs> that I imagined. Because you, you'll see where the story starts. My, my, my story doesn't start in U.S. courts mm -hmm. because I know full well mm -hmm. that he would never be tried in U.S. courts. Uh, but my story starts a little further along in it. But this thing that I speak of would have, would have had to have happened in order for my story to begin. So, uh, uh, Darlene... Um, One thing yes, I think okay. that's uh, interesting that Terry can expound upon a little bit is what, what constitutes a decision by the International Criminal Court to bring prosecution. It isn't just because someone has the opinion that it should be. And I, I think you should explain that process. That's very important. Okay, this is going to be a little uh, uh, sort of technical and judicial, but f f follow with me because if, you, if you're beginning to understand the importance of international criminal law and the International Criminal Court, you know, knowing something about it may not be such a bad idea. Well, uh, first of all, um, 
uh, anybody, literally a country, an organization, or a person can submit uh, a potential crime to the International Criminal Court. Uh, even uh, citizens uh, who are, are a, a citizen of a country that is a non-member state, and even uh, 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 states who are non-member states of the UN can submit what they call a situation to the ICC. Specifically where it goes is the Office of the, of the Prosecution, Office of the Prosecutor, and they vet it in general terms to, to just make sure that it's legitimate, that it has validity, and if they feel that it can be received as a possibility for the International Criminal Court, they pass it along to something called the pre-trial chamber, which are a couple of, a bunch of really smart international criminal attorneys from all over the world, and the pre-trial chamber will look at a case and vet it for years. Mm -hmm two, three, four years. And if after that they're satisfied that the case is a legitimate case, then they, this, the, 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 the suspected criminal will absolutely be brought to, uh, uh, to the International Criminal Court. As you know, uh, they're, they're the home country of the suspect will have first shot, but if they don't, and the pretrial chamber says that it's a valid case, that's how, uh, for instance, George W. Bush could be, could be in my, well, I won't tell you how he got there because that's kind of the fun of how he did it. Um, the other, the, the, uh, oh, the other thing I, I wanted to say is, um, and, uh, you know, we can, we can you, 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 you're at a point where I was at, at, at a, a while in the past. You can just be aware of some of these things and, and, and you, can, you can just, you, you come to the conclusion that, you know, if we don't do something about it, Jefferson wrote, we the people in the Declaration of Independence hold these truths that all men are created equal. Now, all of our of our founding fathers were immigrants. America wasn't even started yet. They were referring to the people of the world. So uh, we can't let these crimes against humanity and against people uh, happen with impunity. And governments are not going to stop st stop it. They're not. And the, and 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 the military is not going to stop it. Eisenhower warned us. The last speech he gave when he left the presidency was about the in military industrial complex, which is the unholy alliance between military and big business corporations that foment up war because it benefits and profits and forwards the business of the military and these companies Halliburton and you I can name them as well as I, I can General Dynamics that make the, the weapons and, the, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the electronics and the computer they make ungodly sums of money their stocks go up their, uh, uh, their, their executives get raises all on the back of the common man so just know that, that, that when you extrapolate it out and study it, we have to get engaged or we are buying wars. We're, we're condoning. If we're not engaged, it de facto condones this and they're going to happen again. People, in every one of these things, they said, are you getting ready to write your book about the 45th president of the United <laughs> States? So I, I, I don't really want to be political about that. I have my own point of view, of course, but I, I like to uh, address this subject. But clearly... Uh, you know, the 43rd president, the 44th president, the 45th president is, is a citizen of the United States and a citizen of the world and subject to their national laws and subject to international criminal law. And if any of him, including our current president, does anything that breaches international criminal court, he will be held accountable in the Hague for it, for sure. Okay, and please. I, I want to say just just a, a few things. Um, I started an organization called Artists for Human Rights um, over ten years ago, and um, I was very I was very interested in Terry's book. I mean, once I got over the shock of what he wanted to do and lost sleep for about two months, <laughs> thinking, "Oh my God!" Um, I realized how important it was, and that um, we have lost sight of the sanctity of human life. Uh, that we as a country can go into another country and a million civilians, citizens of another country can die in a war, 
uh, that was based on false pretenses where it wasn't an immediate threat to our country, that country wasn't, uh, is a pretty terrible thing, and that we lose our boys. And Terry mentioned that 230,000 soldiers were wounded either physically or mentally. Well, in the Vietnam War, 58,000 soldiers died, and in the Iraq War, 4,491. But the reason for that is today, uh, soldiers have better armor and um, better medicine, and uh, because of the equipment we have, medics are able to get to them very quickly. So we save lives that normally wouldn't have been saved, but now they're disabled mentally and physically. So we, we are taking care of 230,000 wounded warriors who will never be the same in their lives. And these are our young men. They're the, they're the boys. As a mother, it's just it's very hard for me to look at that. So I think that uh, what's really important about Terry's book is that um, it reminds us of the sanctity of human life and that the only solution to avoid these wars is communication, good diplomacy, and when you think that diplomacy has failed and the communication has failed, you communicate some more. And you never stop trying to resolve it because war resolves nothing. Uh, hatreds are started that brew for centuries and uh, another war is fought. Um, the other thing that I think it's important to mention is because of this war, um, when uh, Bremer, who was first hired uh, by Bush to come in uh, after the Iraq war started and sort everything out, he uh, at first started to try and work with the Iraqi army and then eventually decided that wasn't a successful action and he fired the Iraqi army. So now you have uh, thousands and thousands of men who were feeding their families and receiving salaries and now they had no jobs. And uh, there was no infrastructure in the country. It was completely destroyed. And as a result, uh, some of those commanders and, and the more uh, religious in that group became the basis of the Islamic State. And thus we have ISIS today. So. Um, it's completely unsettled, the Middle East. Uh, as terrible a dictator as Saddam Hussein was, uh, there and, and many of those dictators have been, there was this sort of awkward balance of power juggling back and forth between the uh, Sunnis and the Shiites, which has existed for thousands of years. And uh, we, in our uh, hubris, thought we could go into Iraq and uh, export democracy into a culture that um, I don't know what it would take to bring it there, but it's certainly not something you can do with a war and by destroying the infrastructure and all the belief systems that they have had in place for thousands of years. So um, that's why this subject is so important, that's why the book is so important, and that's why in this particular moment, as things heat up um, with Korea, we must remember that really the only great solution is negotiation. And, uh, and diplomacy and conversation and talk. And there are those work. I just read an op-ed in the Los Angeles Times recently about some of the fine negotiations and, and, and the willingness on both sides to talk that are there underneath. And we don't hear it from the White House. But it has been going on and it can continue to go on. So I think we should be aware of what's going on. And Terry's book really points the finger at what happened and we, what we must do in the future. Yes, and we have to be careful of the press as well. They're, they're complicit in all this. Bad news sells, they love it. It increases their ratings, they sell more, <coughs> more newspapers and, and all that. But they, they just join the warmongering. They do. They pile on. They make it so terrible, it just creates fear. And both sides, by the way, Republicans and Democrats do that. This is not <laughs> the press, you know, it's ratings for both sides. Yes, uh, am, am, am I still friends of George? I actually, we actually haven't seen him in a long time. Uh, uh, our lives just went, went uh, di di different ways, and uh, people ask if he's read the book. I don't know. I, I, haven't, I didn't talk to him. It just came out, so probably not yet, yeah. <laughs> or if ever. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, another other people say that uh, you know that he he wouldn't dare oppose oppose the book because. If he ever tried to stop the publication of this book, it would become one of the biggest stories in the world. So I'm sure he's going to just <laughs> go the other way and do his painting and his chopping his wood. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
as, as, aside from uh, informing people about the International Criminal Court, what do I hope did, would be what would come of this book? Um, uh, well, one of the reviews said, interestingly enough, that the story is nonfiction telling a, a fiction story. The use of nonfiction in order to tell a fictitious story. So, uh, yes, so much of it is actual true. Though what's not true is that he was abducted off a golf course and taken and put on court. But once he's in there, you know, the, the information that you're told uh, is, you know, it has been deemed to be very, very accurate. Well, and I, I think another important thing to say is that uh, the trial, the book is very balanced. It tells both sides of the story equally. And there are people who will read it who think Bush was right to go in. And there are people who read it who think, no, he truly committed a crime and he should be uh, found guilty. So, and that's important. Uh, Terry wanted, I mean, otherwise it's just, a, you know, him espousing his opinion about the war. I think he has to legally and fairly tell the story, which he does quite well. Uh, I, I will... I'm going to answer your question about what I'd like to see happen, and I'm going to start by telling you something that, I'm, that I don't care whether it happens or not. Uh, uh, I don't, this story is it's highly unlikely that it would become true. I have no interest or need for, for this story to actually become true. Uh, I would I would say not so parenthetically that in that in international criminal law there is no statute of limitations, so uh, a suspected criminal is subject to trial for his crimes until the day he dies. But my interest is not not so much about George W. Bush. My interest is the future, uh, because his you know his the damage has been done. I'd like to try to stop this before damage is done. And it is, to be redundant slightly, is to create something that is, because, you see, the artist can communicate better. Communication is the answer. Communication is the solution. And none communicate better than the artist. The singer, the poet, the painter, the sculptor, the novelist, the playwright, the, the screenwriter, the artist. So if, if, if I can write a story that people will consume because it's interesting and entertaining, and fascinates them in some way, and yet educates them on these fundamental things, and galvanizes them to stand up and do something about it, that'll make me very happy. The question is, um, uh, are, th are there incidences where w war is valid and legal? The answer is 100% yes. Uh, and it's easy to find. You can g Google it, but it has to do with a situation when, uh, uh, when, the United when there's a clear and present danger of, uh, against America, Americans, or our friends. Uh, no one would say that our war, all wars are unnecessary because that, of course, wouldn't be true. World War I, when you study it with the sinking of the Lusitanian by the German s s s submarines, absolutely necessary to preserve Europe as we know it today. Uh, World War II, 100% with the Nazis and what they were doing to the, their people and citizens, 100% valid. The Korean War, when, the, when North Korea and China were trying to invade our friends, yeah, there, there are wars that are absolutely so because they, 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 they uh, uh, co constitute the definition of what war is, and Congress then will, will uh, give, the, give the president what's called war powers, which, uh, which validates a president in the military to wage the war. But again, so many wars are unnecessary. That's my point. I'm not saying, because I, I'm not a peacemonger. I believe that, 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 uh, uh, that the, the United States and all uh, major powers ought to have a strong military, very strong military, to protect and defend, not, in, not invade and conquer countries on the other side of the world uh, who are, are not a clear and present danger to the United States. Does that answer your question? Okay. That's an interesting question. How, how can the International Criminal Court physically get accused uh, people who were heads or former heads of, of countries uh, into court? The answer is that the, uh, the umbrella for the International Criminal Court is the United Nations. And there, are, there is a militia, there is a military, there, is, there are UN peacekeeping troops that are soldiers and troops that are armed and, 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 and uh, that they, the International Criminal Court has access to UN uh, security forces. 
to do whatever. But when you think about it, if 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 so these UN UN security forces can be people from, you know, Britain and France and all that, and they're and they're, they're they have a mandate from the United from the International Criminal Court to go get somebody, and American soldiers they would be fighting their friends, people that they were in wars and battles with. So I was thinking it could be allies. 100%. You're going to love a chapter in this book. <laughs> it's a very good question. But do you, you're okay with the answer? You got the answer? Yeah. And, and I think also it's important to note that um, uh, it's, it's if the national court uh, is unwilling. What, what, what is the unwilling exact? Unwilling or unable. Unwilling or unable. Uh, to prosecute, uh, then the uh, head of state who's accused of the war crime by the International Criminal Court is served a subpoena, if the International Criminal Court decides that the case has merit, is served a subpoena, well, he's not likely to show up in court in the Netherlands. So then uh, he's safe if he stays in his country. But if, if he goes outside the country, no, and there's lots of discussions by about uh, why certain leaders never leave their home country because they fear they would be subjected to arrest for war crimes. Another interesting question, uh, people ask how, how is a verdict rendered at the International Criminal Court? The International Criminal Court has no juries. They do not assemble a jury and swear in a jury. Uh, there are 18 judges at the International Criminal Court, men and women from all over the world, really. Uh, and for every case has an odd number of judges assigned to it. One or three uh, is, is the usual. Uh, and so they, that individually or collectively, they will deliberate, and it is mandated that they must render a decision. If they, they're a judge at the ICC and they sit on the case, they have to render. So you don't have any hang, uh, hung juries or hung judges in this case. So uh, that's what we have, in, you'll see in this story. It's international criminal judges uh, that, that, that rule and preside over the, over the case. Well, I, as a screenwriter, a playwright, and a novelist, which of the forms do I prefer? Um, well, I will tell you, right off the crack of the bat, a novel is... is I would say on the order of five to ten times more work than a screenplay or a play. It just is. I mean, it's it's just, but, but obviously the scope and the it's almost limitless what you can do. And, and movies are are has have great scope too. I mean, we all all seen movies, uh, and 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 to some extent plays. Although you have the limits of theatricality. But I have, I'm ducking your question. I'm going to try to answer it. Uh, I see myself writing more um, um, uh, screenplays and plays than I do novels uh, because uh, I can just turn them. I can turn them over quickly. I actually, believe it or not, have a kind of a short span of attention, even though <laughs> this got my attention for you know four years now. But un unless uh, I, I think more screenplays and stage plays, unless which was the case of this book, I just can't stand not to write it. In which case, I would write another novel. Mm -hmm. And then I guess it has to do with the collaborative nature of a screenwriting screenplay, where you have to work with the producer and the director. And your novel is you, your voice, you're speaking, you're putting it out there. You're not having to correct to deal with that. Yeah, that can cut both ways, though. Yeah. <laughs> you're alone. You're like, just leave me alone. I got yeah. this. In it. <laughs> Why did I decide to write this story as a as a novel? As a, I I thought that the uh, that the scope of the story was so massive and it was so dense that uh, when I when I, cons I considered it, but I just didn't think that a screenplay, which is 120, 140 pages, whatever, because it's got to be what two hours of a movie, I just didn't think that it could do justice to all of the component parts of this narrative. Things would have to be truncated and cut out, and get in there and lose that, and jump to the to, to the to the uh, to the the verdict in one way or another, and and even even less even a, a stage play could accommodate this narrative even less because of the restriction restrictions of theater. So a novel it is. I'm gonna hug that guy. Repeat the question. You wanted to know if, if there's any plans to make it into a movie. So I uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, actually, again, I don't I don't know that this book. Uh, if they make a movie of it, I think they have to get in and get out of it without really telling the full scope of the narrative that's presented in this book. My dream is that it becomes a multiple episode television event. 
or a mi mi mini series. A month where they can really deal with each chapter. And believe me, there's four or five or six, six cliff hangers. They're, oh my God, what's going to happen? Well, tune in next week and see. So thanks for asking. And there is there are some nibbles. And by, by the way, because of the subject matter and how important it is and how current it is, universal and timeless themes, war and peace, sanctity. I hope it's, it's made in, in English, but uh, translated in many languages around the world so that the people of the world can see it, not just, not just English speaking people. I'm sure you heard this, so I wonder what your, what your idea, what your thoughts about this are, but, you know, um, you know, Bush is scared, you know, like there's been several times where we had to hightail it out, you know, and Rumsfeld too, right, and Jane, uh, because they were afraid that they might be picked up, you know, in certain countries. Yes, it, it is true uh, that when a, a person is suspected of, I say suspected because, listen, there has not been a trial. So someone can be suspected or accused, but not, not, cannot be called a criminal until a proper trial, the due course of a proper trial can occur. But it is true that an individual who is suspected to have committed international criminal crimes is much safer if he stays, for instance, in the United States. That, that does not apply necessarily to the UK or France, but certainly to the United States. Yes, ma'am? Aren't they informed that they, they're, or is it totally secret? N no, but the, uh, the, the, they're not informed until the ICC formally mm -hmm. issues uh, the, a uh, subpoena. the, the uh, subpoena. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so this could be going on without that person knowing. Hundred percent. What's going on? This thing could it be 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 being studied at the pre-trial uh, 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 chamber at the uh, in okay. the office of the prosecution at the International Criminal uh, Criminal Court? A hundred percent. There's no requirement that the court has to inform. No, 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 you mean, no. So All Bush wouldn't know uh, that there no, was pre-trial. No, they're just gathering information. It could go on for years. Yeah, it could but, go on for years. But because they haven't made a decision yet. Well, but they're they're exploring, they're investigating. But he would know they're people. exploring, wouldn't Not he? Not necessarily. Not know. necessarily. Wouldn't even know they're under investigation or the, or the court's being heard. Not uh, yeah. Court. Well, they, well. Not the court being heard, uh, but that, that there is that process that's underway. Yeah, it, of of research and discovery. No. But no. If he's aware of and understands international law, which he must, he must be a little bit nervous. I would say. Yeah, oh, I, I would think if I were him, I don't know, but I, if I were him, I'd be nervous as hell. The other point, just just to yours though, though, is if 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 uh, a, a former president was uh, accused of war crimes or crimes of aggression, or there's four or five different ones, and he was brought to trial, he would be entitled to uh, 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 collect a defense team, defense attorneys. He would be granted time to do that, and not rushed, by the way, to, uh, to assemble his defense team, and they would be granted a huge amount of time to do their own research. So the ICC would never uh, sort of do a quick trial where they had to get, you know, somebody had to, you, you got to get your defense attorneys and then they're going to have, you know, three months to study. No, no, they would have years to amass their their defense arguments against the prosecution. So it's not an intensive sabotage, though? No, 100% not. The, just the contrary. They insist that it be fair, and it would be fair. The question is, um, is this story possible because the United States is not a member state of the International Criminal Court? Uh, let, let's let's discuss uh, the fact that we're that, the, that America is not uh, a, a member state. Uh, under President Bill Clinton's um, pr presidency, and with Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who was pretty great Secretary of State. Uh, one of the last things that Bill Clinton did during his presidency is to sign the le letter petitioning the ICC to have the United States become a member of the International Criminal Court. One of the first things that George W. Bush did when he became president was to withdraw America's request to be, uh, to be a member of the International Criminal Court. The question is why would he do that? Uh, I'll tell you the two things that most legal scholars say. 
I don't know, and I don't know whether anybody would know whether he was planning to do anything. This was early in his presidency, and rem remember, this would have been 2001 when he, January 2001, when he was inaugurated, and 9/11 was two, September 2000. I don't know that he had anything in mind, but what you, what uh, uh, U.S. legal scholars say is the reason why the why the United States is not a member state of the ICC is that the United States. Uh, has very strong feelings about protecting and helping people around the world, protecting and helping our friends around the world. And often it takes a strong arm in military. And the United States does what it thinks is the right thing to do. And they don't want some international criminal court with a whole bunch of, of you know, non-American people standing in judge of what the United States does. Uh, I don't know. That's some people may think it's that's arrogant. It's some people may think it's the United States is entirely justified. But that's one reason. The, the other reason that is stated is that uh, uh, American soldiers are often asked to do. Uh, very serious things that may be identified as, as war crimes, but they would have done so under orders from a commanding officer. And uh, uh, the, the um, American position is that we do not want our so soldiers subject to international criminal law for the very same, simple reason that they may be, they would be doing things under uh, orders from their commanding officers. Now, that argument really doesn't hold much water in the sense that the ICC uh, prosecutes the single person most responsible and then goes down the chain of the command. I can't imagine, you know, if you take the Iraq war, you start with George W. Bush, and then there's, wow, well, I mean, you know, it would be Cheney and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and maybe Condoleezza Rice and... And then, uh, you know, Tommy Franks, I mean, who knows how far this thing would go. And these people wouldn't live long enough, probably. But so that, that's why uh, the, the, the America is not a member of the, the, of the uh, International. International Criminal Court. But uh, I hope, I frankly hope we are someday because, uh, you know, we're not just citizens of the United States anymore. We're citizens of the world. And, uh, uh, you know, we do a lot of great things, uh, but, you know, People around the world have their own view about that, and I think we need to comply with the wishes and hopes of, of all of humanity. Are we done? Yay! Okay, okay. yay! Okay, all right. I'm going to sit right here with my pen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.